Good afternoon and welcome to today's webcast. Today we'll be discussing clinical pathways leverage to accelerate performance and quality, cost, and patient experience. My name is Becky Matias and I'm a lead consultant here at Galen. I've worked in healthcare for over 25 years in various roles. Over the last nine years, much of my focus has been designing, implementing, um, optimized workflows to drive value-based care initi initiatives, leveraging the Allscripts TouchWorks modules. Joining me today is Laura Gold. Laura, would you like to tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Hello, everyone. My name is Laura Gold, and I am also a lead consultant here at Galen and have had the good fortune of being with them for about six years now. I worked in healthcare my entire adult life. Um, and in the last 15 years, I've been focusing primarily with electronic health data records. We do have a lot of information to share with you today, and we expect to present for about an hour, and that will leave us 30 minutes of time devoted to questions and answers. Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, your phones have been muted. If questions arise during the webcast, you may submit them into the chat area that you see in the red box in the lower right-hand side of your screen. All questions and answers submitted will be posted along with the slides um, to our public wiki in the next few days. And then as a side note, throughout the discussion today, there will be multiple cited links. We'll be including a resource slide at the end of the deck um, so you guys don't have to worry about writing down or remembering those links that we reference. All right, Laura, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Becky. Welcome, everyone. Today's agenda for the Clinical Pathways, we'll be talking about pathways and the different names that they are known by, current trends, various approach considerations, including clinical review, design, education, and implementation for your organization to think about. We will provide a demonstration on some of the ways organizations have developed and successfully implemented, as well as, as, well as discussing the benefits and challenges of clinical pathway leverage. Clinical pathways may also be referred to as clinical practice guidelines, or CPSs, care maps, integrated care pathways, or even just care pathways. During our time today, we'll be referring to them as clinical pathways. So what are they? Clinical pathways are multidisciplinary plans of best clinical practices targeting specified groups of patients with a distinct diagnosis that aid the coordination and delivery of high quality care. They are both a tool and a concept which embedded guidelines, protocols, and locally agreed, evidence-based, patient-centered, best practices into everyday use for the individual patient. Clinical pathways can be viewed as an application of process management and a way of thinking to improve patient care and patient care experiences. One of the goals with pathway adoption is to re-engage, revisit, and refocus on the patient's overall journey rather than the contribution of each specialty independently. Instead, it emphasizes working together as a cross-functional team. It's more than just a guideline or protocol. A pathway design anticipates the foreseeable actions which will most commonly represent best practices for most patients most of the time. Applying a pathway will include prompts for clinical user staff that appear at the appropriate time during the patient encounter and whether they have been carried out and whether the results have been as expected. In this way, results are recorded and important questions and actions are not overlooked. However, pathways are typically not prescriptive. The patient's journey is an individual one and an integral piece of the purpose of the pathway is to capture information on variances meaning when different clinical decisions are made leading to these variances in patient outcomes, pathways support reductions on the variation in care. Clinical pathways also 
excuse me, clinical pathways can also be viewed as an educational reference to support the health system's initiative to streamline the order processes and to reduce unnecessary and redundant testing to help improve the patient experience and thus reduce cost. Clinical pathways are not a new idea, but have been gaining a newfound popularity. As healthcare continues to evolve in attempts to keep patients healthier, and as a combination of risk contracting, value-based care, and advancing technologies, we are at an age where we can really apply pathways more effectively. The process. So are you wondering how to get a pathway started and introduced to your org? You'll want to start with clinical review. In the review, it will include key decision makers in your organization who are involved and committed to improving the quality and efficiency of patient care through the utilization of effective resource management strategies. A project sponsor, along with the clinical counselor board, provide insight and recommendations around pathway selection and based on the organizational needs and goals. The team is responsible for reviewing all of the literature and producing a high-level flowchart, which I'll show you here in a little bit. Design. The design phase includes a variety of resources. You'll want a physician champion who will be knowledgeable in the clinical elements of the pathway. Usually this will be a specialist in that area of practice, for example, for um, a pathway on GERD, you'd want a GI provider. For a pathway with thyroid disorder, you would want an endocrinologist, etc. The champion will make themselves available as the pathway is being built for any clarification on clinical questions and decisions that may arise during the build and creation process. Um, an example of this is your organization might have five or six six different CBCs uh, with five or six different resultables within them, and one specific resultable needs to be considered during the review process, so you would want to make sure that that one is included in your build. Depending on how your organizational hierarchy is structured, the physician champion may provide final approval prior to the pathway being released into production. You'll also want to include a representative from the quality team. This person will be an excellent resource for for guidance as to what, if any, value-based initiatives can be incorporated into the pathway that's being considered for implementation. In addition, an educational team member to assist with workflow analysis, as well as to advise on training implications, communicating the existence of the pathway, and how to best present training to your end users. And of course, you're going to want an IT application resource who's familiar with the EHR, who can interpret the pathway, and knows what build tools are available within the EHR to build out the pathway, coordinate meetings, do build review, facilitate interaction between your physician champion and counsel. In terms of design workflow, you'll have your IT application analysts work with the educational and clinical resources within your org to confirm existing workflows. Depending on time constraints, consider performing a gap analysis to see if there will be additional opportunities to streamline processes or workflows, as this can work in your favor for long-term adoption. If there are opportunities for change, review them with your organizational governance to approve prior to building and incorporating them into a new or altered workflow into the clinical pathway. Using a flowchart or a visio diagram is encouraged in a great way to visually present the pathway to clinical counsel providers and other end users as to the pathway workflows. It also serves as a way to verify that there are no open loops and confirms all the patient care needs are met and addressed. Once the clinical pathway workflow is solidified and approved, your IT app resource will start the build of the pathway using the tools within the EHR to incorporate all of the guidelines, orders, education, instructions, and recommended follow-up care. Your IT resource will work closely with the physician champion for guidance and feedback and build-related questions. And don't forget those weekly status meetings. You can't have a successful project without meetings, can you? The meeting will serve to keep the project on track, the IT application analysts can provide updates and demos of what's being built, and these meetings will also be used to work with the education staff to plan educational strategies. Speaking of education, 
Uh, this is going to provide recommendations around the best available tools for your organization to get the word out that the pathways are available. They know what approaches have worked historically in the past. Some examples that come to mind are utilizing a share drive, newsletter, video tutorial, job aids, or online um, instruction. Think about these items earlier in the planning process will prove to reduce frustration during implementation. And as far as implementation goes, select your implementation of rollout. Are you going to do a pilot site, a pilot pathway, a big bang? Are you going to do a beta site and pathway? Um, think about your end users and providers. Are they going to need on-site support and assistance? Or are they pretty comfortable navigating in your electronic medical record? Would a quick tutorial or a short online video suffice? Again, you know your organization and your end users. Make a feasible plan, schedule it, announce it, remind them it's coming, and then roll it out into production. Clinical pathways exist in many disciplines. They can be geared towards groups of people like children, adults, geriatrics, or specialty, or specialty oriented such as cardiac. There are also pathways that are location specific such as ambulatory, inpatient, or surgical. In the sampling here, these are mostly ambulatory driven. What's important to note is that there are a multitude of guidelines available that have been peer reviewed and cited with study details. Clinical pathways are not limited to what is listed. You can develop your own unique pathway for your organization. Remember, they are customizable and can be uniquely developed for your organizational needs. So how do you get started? Where do you go look? Clinical pathways are very often based from the already adopted recommendation of leading healthcare authorities, such as the American Academy of Pediatrics, Gold Initiative for COPD, and the American Diabetes Association. Medical societies, the American Academy of Family Practitioners are also excellent resources as well as HEDIS for this type of information. Keep in mind that the guidelines cited here, specifically the Standards of Medical Care and Diabetes, which is published by the ADA, is a mere 200 plus page document. The guide is inclusive and it contains all of the studies that drive the recommendations, the algorithms, and the treatment plans. The point being, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. The information is there for you. You just need to be able to read and interpret the manual. For today's webcast, we have opted to feature a clinical pathway focused around diabetes management. You might be asking why. Well, we all know that diabetes is a huge health crisis in this country, and the care and management of this subset of patients can be a challenge. Just look at the few of the statistics recently cited from the ADA. $322 billion are spent annually on diabetes and pre-diabetes management in the U.S. In addition to the financial aspect of the human cost um, is just as staggering. Every 21 seconds, someone in the U.S. is diagnosed with diabetes. In addition, 84 million Americans who have prediabetes are at risk of developing type 2. And what's really striking about this is that 90% of them don't even know they have it. Here is an example of a very basic, straightforward diabetes management clinical pathway in a flowchart formula or excuse me, format. This section is only focusing on pre-diabetes management and care. From a clinical standpoint, diabetes encompasses almost all of the areas of a clinical pathway. Orders, results, patient education, Rx management, durable medical supplies, comorbidities, specialist referral and care, and primary care. We are really looking at a standard of care and an organizational commitment to, to guide providers and thus reduce treatment variances. A comprehensive clinical pathway will demonstrate specifically what actions at what points of care lead to the best outcomes. From the EHR standpoint, there is a lot of functionality associated with this particular pathway, and we take a look at that during the demo. But first, let's walk through this one at a high level. The care plan starts by defining who should be screened for prediabetes. 
This ties back to the fact that 90% of the patients don't even know that they are at risk for it as a result of, of the ADA findings, and they've come up with who should be screened and tested. I'm not going to go through each line item, but in plain terms, we're looking at patients who are over 45 or who are overweight, may have a family history of type 2 diabetes, etc. The patients who are in those categories will receive an A1C or a glucose tolerance test or even a fasting blood sugar. Based on the result, the patient will be moved along the care plan. So if that test is normal, we'll retest at the interval divine excuse me, defined by the Clinical Review Board. This pathway indicates that that would be every three years. However, if the test was abnormal, and depending on the how abnormal, then based on the criteria, the patient would be diagnosed with diabetes, and he or she would be moved along the clinical pathway. The patient advances through the pathway, starting specific medications, potentially some type of insulin, definitely lifestyle changes, probably some additional lab testing, um, assessment of cold conditions, and a repeat A1C at the specified interval. The pathway encompasses the various needs of the patient anticipating potential outcomes, and the clinical pathway prompts shifts as the patient's conditions stabilize, improve, or decline. Notice the pathway flowchart treatment goals roll into the A1C result goals, lifestyle management, education, immunization, referrals, and follow-up care. The pathway also advances to include medication guidelines and recommendations based on the effectiveness and cost, when to engage in monotherapy, dual therapies, or even triple therapies. For example, metformin is the medication of choice as it is economical and effective. The diabetes management clinical pathway incorporates insulin guidelines as indicated here. In four slides, we reviewed just one clinical pathway. It's a lot of information and presents a huge challenge clinically to manage all of those pieces. Now that you've seen the diabetes management pathway conceptually, I'm going to turn the presentation back over to Becky, who will provide a demo on how you might incorporate pathway concepts into your electronic medical record. Becky? Thanks, Laura. That was a lot of information. Let me go ahead and get my test system pulled back up. Great. Um, so I have preloaded a couple of scenarios in for, for us today. Um, I do want to mention normally, because I've been a trainer for such a long time, that we always want to select patients from our daily schedule so we connect all that information to the encounter. But in the interest in of time, I'm just going to toggle my patients. So my first um, patient is Jane Test, and my second patient is going to be Bill Test. And I'm going to be leveraging the Allscripts EHR today. Now, within the, the Allscripts EHR, we have lots of functionality, especially around diabetes management. Um, we've been doing diabetes initiatives for a really long time. But some of that functionality um, is that you may have heard terminology for are reminders, flow sheets, note forms, active problems, favorite groups, order groups, as well as care guides. And we're going to take a look at all of those different pieces as we um, step through the workflow. So implementing clinical pathways really does support optimal workflows, and I'm going to demonstrate them on uh, in this in as we walk through the care plan so i have jane tossed up and she meets our criteria for pre-screening so if i can just refer back to what laura was talking about we can see that jane is over 45 years old um, and if i as i start flipping through um, what we really want to do is have our nursing staff be able to review charts quickly um, so if the Jane has presented for care. I'm doing a quick run through the chart. I'm taking a look at her problems. They see that she doesn't have diabetes diagnosed. Um, she's going to have a blank um, health management plan. Maybe she's a newer patient. 
And we can go ahead and look at the diabetes flow sheet that Laura and I built. Now you can see she does have an A1C entered, and that's because I went ahead and entered that prior to us getting on the webcast today. What's really nice about flow sheets is there's right-click functionality that makes it very streamlined for the staff to go ahead and get A1Cs and other results entered prior to the patient, the provider entering the room. Now, what I've seen a lot of organizations do is if a patient meets criteria for a prescreening, they'll go ahead and do that point of care A1C before a provider is even aware that the patient has presented for care. Now, this A1C is within normal range. So let's go ahead, right at this point, we know that she will have to be seen every three years from our care plan guideline. Let me just go ahead and make an encounter here. And we are in a test system, so it is a little bit sluggish. I did talk about having order groups these are really nice tools. Um, they became available in this particular EHR um, in 11.4.1, so a few years ago, that allows us to create a streamlined workflow um, where with one click, we're entering our ordering area or the ad clinical item workspace is the, the official name. But it, what I wanna bring to mind is that we do have a medication in here, we have labs in here, um, we have risk scoring in here. So this is really easy, nice functionality. Um, this is a great way to optimize or streamline a workflow. Um, for Jane, we do wanna go ahead and enter that reminder for the A1C in three years. So I'm just gonna give her a good right click, open up our reminder screen. I'm going to attach this to a health maintenance problem. And we're gonna tell the system that every year Jane's gonna, going to need to have this test repeated every three years, rather. I did that a little bit wrong, guys, but you get the idea. Um, on her health management plan, when I save this, we have a new due date. So we don't have to remember it. It's going to prompt the nursing staff through their review of the chart. Now, in addition, Galen also um, has some functionality that we layer on top of all scripts called eCalc. And these are health calculators um, that we've been in, um, building for a really long time. Um, providers are using health calculators all over um, the United States right now. And a lot of times they're not integrated with their EHR. There's a lot of clicking, a lot of searching, um, and quite frankly, a lot of maintenance. Um, and they're so valuable and easy to use. So on Jane, we do have an ADA um, diabetes risk calculator. This is a test system, so um, excuse that it is an outdated or version, but you'll get the idea here. Um, it's citing in her gender, her age, her height, her weight. Um, we could fill in her ethnicity whether she had had gestational diabetes, we would have gathered that information in our intake, we, the nurse could indicate it. Um, and I didn't show you, but I did set up her mom um, as having diabetes because that's one of our calculator um, factors. She's at a much higher risk. Um, and I'm just gonna choose that she is fact, um, physically active. And the system will go ahead and create a risk score that we can add back to the chart. Um, and there are many different calculators. This is just um, one of them that I wanted to spotlight for you. Just one moment while it's adding it back to the chart. In prod environments, this is a pretty instantaneous uh, process. Let's see if I can switch over to test bill. Uh, always save your information. EHR 101. And we've gone ahead and added that. Um, now I'm going to switch over to Bill, and Bill is out in the waiting room, and I am the nurse, and I'm taking a quick look at his chart, and I see that he does have diabetes. 
when I switch over to his health management plan, um, and I do have this in a tiled view. You guys may have a different view on your systems. Um, there's a little icon here. I always like to share that little tidbit of information. Um, we can go ahead and resize these windows as well. But the main takeaway here is that when he was diagnosed, someone went in and entered all of the criteria that we needed to follow him. So when he was set up for a diabetic foot exam once a year, he's supposed to have an A1C every three months. Um, of course, we wanna follow his lipids. That's also in the plan of managing the, the comorbidities. We're gonna do that once a year. And then of course, um, those dilated eye exams, we want them every year. Now, um, Bill may be non-compliant or he doesn't come in very often, but we do have some overdues. Um, by protocol, if he was due for, um, like he is due for a diabetic foot exam, and I've seen this done in a couple of ways. Um, I've seen providers do all the monofilament testing, but I've also seen nursing staff um, be trained to do it. The best place to do an entry, though, for a diabetic foot exam, I, I don't particularly love it from health management. I really like to look at flow sheets. Uh, I like the clinical staff. This is just a really nice view. Um, they can trend bill over time of how his A1Cs, whether he's gotten better, what he, whether he's gotten worse, how often he's come in, and where we are um, with him generally. Now, um, for Bill, um, we can see, we could see from the health management plan that he really wasn't due for an A1C, but he is due for a diabetic foot exam. Now, what's also nice about the flow sheets, and it's kind of like this in most systems, is there is some pretty good right-click functionality where we could go ahead and enter results. I'm not gonna walk through um, doing that, just knowing that that functionality is there. The other thing that I really like about flow sheets um, is that they can be used as a training tool for um, your patient education. So we could select A1Cs and graph them over time. You could even print that or share that with a patient. Um, so I always like to point that out as well. Also, um, there are there is an immunization component that is recommended with most diabetic initiatives. And we're looking for flu shots, pneumovax vac vaccines, and hep B vaccines. Now nursing has finished with Bill. I'm just gonna hop over to the chart viewer and I've already started a note on him. And I'm just gonna go ahead and edit that note. So we've now switched over that the provider has entered the room and he has done his examination. He's talking with Bill about what they're gonna do next, what prescriptions needed are needed. Um, but I do just wanna point out that I also talked about using note forms. So within the HPI, we, we kind of plopped them in here. They certainly could be put in other areas of note, but Laura went ahead and configured the full clinical pathway for diabetes. Um, and we put it out on the front side of the system. It does give it a bit of a scroll. Um, everything in blue are order driven. So it draws the, the provider's eyes. And then another way that we could leverage note forms, um, and this is kind of the way that I've seen them leveraged a little bit more often, is we can make it a click if you want to area. And we've Im I've embedded it um, so that providers who want to go take a look at the pathway can do that. Um, and typically governance and your clinical review board and your diabetes educator, again, like Laura said before, they know your organization, they know what works, um, and they would make recommendations as to where you would leverage these kind of, this kind of information. I also wanna point out, we got a little bit creative. Um, Insulin titration um, on a couple of the clients that I was implementing, it was really difficult to put this information or figure out how to embed it for providers. Most often they're gonna have to click a share drive or we're gonna have to print it out and tape it under their, their keyboard. Um, so we also could build it as a note form um, and as things change, this could be updated each year. So I, I really like that option for insulin titration. 
And then finally, I do want to talk about care guides. So doctor has gone down. Um, he has placed the green check mark to assess diabetes for today. Let's see if I can get my care guide to open here. Just one second. There it goes. I've been in the system a lot, so it had just timed out on me. So we've um, actually built a couple of different pathways. One of the interesting things that Laura and I found as we started to work on this webcast is we had really leveraged different pieces of the system in, a different, in different ways. Now, just as a reminder, care guides truly are the best way for providers to order. Um, and typically, they weren't rolled out when you rolled out your EHR, it's something that you did afterwards. And I found that um, some organizations, their providers were just really resistant to using them. Use, when you start looking at clinical pathways, this is a great time to reintroduce them because you can do a lot of one-click one ordering. Um, and it really is a pretty easy train for, for folks who have been on the system for some time, it's a big difference than when they first implemented. Um, they, they can be busy and overwhelming. Um, so care guides, um, there's a few things that I wanna point out. If we start right at the top, we have embedded guidelines. Now these are completely customizable on the back side of the system. Um, so if there's something that your governance or clinical review really wants to focus on, they can put it in these little guides. Um, people can open them if they want to open them. That's really good in a residency-based practice or really nice training support. We can do them at the care guide level. We can do them at the header level. And we can also do them at the medication level. You do want to keep in mind that if you put a bookmark guideline on every single one of these, people really aren't going to open them. So you can choose which ways work for you. Now on Laura's care guide, um, she has chosen, along with the Clinical Review Council, to really name, we've used the, the takeaway here is you can use these header names in a really meaningful way. We have when to use metformin, that it is the drug of choice, and what the A1C level should be. And Laura has done that throughout the headers, all of those little pieces and tidbits of information that we want to drive home to providers, um, she actually has been able to put into the header. Now, instead of scrolling down through, um, which is one of the things that the providers really don't like to do, I always tell people in case they don't know, um, there are hyperlinks that do the scroll for you. Um, and we can see that Laura has put in those immunizations, her screening labs, um, patient education, referrals, everything that's in that CP or that clinical pathway is here within her care guide. I'm gonna go ahead and I am just going to cancel out of this care guide. And I'm gonna go ahead and open the alternate. Now in my care guide, I did the, the same kind of approach in terms of I have a full clinical pathway up here um, at the care guide level. And then for my providers, they really didn't like the busyness. They were really resistant. Um, they didn't, they, they really hadn't done a lot of care guide leverage. So they really wanted these to be kind of simple so that as they brought up providers, new providers on the care guide that they would be more likely to read down through. Those are really two different objectives that Laura and I had between a couple of our different clients. And again, I'm going to go ahead and just use the hyperlink. A um, couple of things I want to point out is um, often on care guides, you'll have labs that are from a particular lab, but you'll also have point of care labs. Um, and sometimes within the dictionary, it's hard for, in the naming conventions, for providers to know which one is which. Um, so you can handle that with headers. Um, also, at the, at the header level, um, we've gone ahead and put in how often, whatever those parameters are, that recheck in three months. Um, we can add all of that information into the guideline or the header. Um, 
just kind of scrolling down through, we have follow-ups, referrals, instructions. One other thing I do want to point out um, in a care guide is that your reminders, we can put a couple of them in here. We could put the three-month one in, the six-month one, um, and that allows providers to order with just one click. Um, so that certainly supports um, their initiatives a little bit better, and it's definitely better than doing the long way around the mountain when they're ordering. We can populate that information for them. Um, we could also have the nursing staff, if they're setting up those reminders, having them associate a care guide um, and be able to put in this information for the providers. I've seen it done that way as well. Um, again, follow-ups, referrals, instructions. Um, I didn't really leverage this with um, my clients, but I really do like to point out the precautions, um, especially with new diabetics. These are really good delivered advice um, to tell patients when to call in. I'm gonna go ahead and cancel out of here. Um, and I'm just gonna show you just one more thing. Go ahead and close this note out. Now we talked about managing comorbidities. And there is also an eCalc looking at cardiovascular risk um, that I put in our favorites and I just wanted to go ahead and show you real quick. Um, it's pulling in those cholesterol numbers that we saw that he had his cholesterol drawn. Um, if I had a diagnosis of hypertension in there, that would have pulled in as well. And then we could go in and run that risk calculator, um, which providers really do like. So. We've configured our EHR. Um, Laura, let's go back and discuss what we do now. Okay, thank you, Becky. That uh, was a lot of information, and as you guys can see, there are a lot of creative ways that you can develop and, and build out your clinical pathway. So now that that's been done, let's talk about our implementation planning. As we discussed earlier, how are you going to implement your rollout of your clinical pathway? Our recommendation is to use a pilot group and one pathway initially. Pilot groups prove to, be a ben prove to be beneficial with newer concepts, and the pilot users can provide valuable feedback in regards to workflow and ease of use. It also allows the opportunity to tweak the pathways if needed. Then your educational materials can be finalized. We touched upon educational earlier in the presentation, too. There are multiple avenues to share and distribute education. In the past, with other clients, we've seen them utilize the share drives, doing webinars, putting it in newsletters, um, even doing a short 60-second tutorial or less has been used. Uh, remember to incorporate the various learning styles and be mindful of the time constraints your user providers may have. Perhaps a step-by-step -step written document that can be accessed during their non-patient hours or in their downtime would be more helpful than having an on-site resource available on Go Live Day staring at them, seeing if they need help. Also for training, you want to train your end users um, and your support staff as to what the clinical pathways are and how they are meant to be utilized. Definitely notify your help desk that a new initiative is being rolled out and they can help support calls that may come in as a result of questions surrounding their use. So you'll develop and decide what your rollout schedule is. Is it going to be big bang, individual, one at a time? Um, make sure that you send that information out so everybody knows that it's happening. Uh, decide if your end users are going to need um, on-site support. And then lastly, you're going to want to think about reporting. As an organization, you'll want to decide how you'll be measuring utilization. Some of the measurement factors may be driven by the capabilities of your EHR. In some cases, you may need to consider custom reporting to abstract the data that you deem valuable. For the diabetes management clinical pathway, there are a lot of moving parts and reportable items to monitor and consider. Based on the health of your clinical population, your clinical governance team will want to establish which reportable elements or criteria they want to monitor. Examples. Um, you might want to do the number of patients who meet pre-diabetes screening versus the number of patients who actually receive the screening. 
Another example would be um, the patients that are eligible and should be having an annual diabetic exam and those who are not uh, meeting that or doing that piece. Also, you'll want to do an annual review. Just as we encourage our patients to have annual exams to keep themselves healthy, we want to establish a plan to review your clinical pathway. Standards of care can change, and you'll want to incorporate those updates to keep your clinical pathway current. Is there a new treatment protocol that needs to be incorporated? Um, you know, we've definitely seen a lot of that change with diabetes care for new medications, new options, um, and things of that nature. As a personal example, I have a child who was diagnosed with type 1 uh, diabetes back when he was 11. Granted, it was in the mid-90s, um, but the standards for diagnosing people with diabetes mellitus was a blood glucose level of 140 and up. Today, we start considering treatment for patients with blood glucoses when they're at 100 or higher. You also want to keep um, up to date with your application upgrades, although we haven't really focused on that a lot during this presentation. There are a lot of components and themes, if you will, of value-based care initiatives that most of us have been leveraging for a long time. New features are also presented in upgraded versions of electronic health record systems, so you'll want to stay on top of that. Benefits and challenges. Um, Probably one of the main things that I can drive home is plan, plan, and more planning. Um, and some of these uh, questions that you'll want to consider are on this slide. Uh, successful clinical pathway implementation starts with comprehensive and thorough planning. Casting a wide net during your planning phase to incorporate all of the teams, the departments, and entities that may have interest or that would potentially be impacted the team approach, the governance piece, the education, the clinical review, quality, the more inclusive you are in your planning phase, the less likely you will be during your execution of having a wrench thrown in when an unincluded department observes a significant workflow that was not considered. Also, having strong governance and informed providers. Clinical pathways represent standards of care, and they are not individual care plans and should not be viewed as such. They are evidence-based care plans that contain patient-centered algorithms, statistics, and treatment guidelines. A strong governance aids and assists when and if an individual provider requests individual revisions that are outside the scope of the clinical pathway. You'll need and appreciate a strong physician champion who is engaged with user providers and is proactive and committed to drive full clinical pathway adoption. This concludes my part of the presentation today. Becky, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Well, Laura, that was a lot of information. Now, as promised, this is the resource slide that will be included when we post this up on our public wiki in the next few days. Now, I do want to take just a second to point out the American Academy of Family Physicians. Um, when we were re researching, I really found that website um, to be really user-friendly for clinical guidelines. Um, and if you're really new to this concept, that's a really good place to start your research. All right, and we are going to open up for questions and answers. I'll turn it back to our moderator. Okay, perfect.